It's like being on stage here. <laughs> I think um, this talk is here. First of all, uh, Shireen Shaloub was going to do this, but she's, her plane is not getting in until 6.30 or something like that. Or actually, I guess tonight, later. So, um, but I'm sure she'd be willing to give it also again tomorrow if you'd like to hear her. And she has a chance to talk about red flags in, in uh, vascular EDS uh, a couple of times uh, in the next few days. And you will find her uh, great to listen to. Um, I think the, the reason that this talk is here now is uh, a reflection of our experience in working with people who have um, vascular EDS, other kinds of EDS, and particularly with hypermobility in EDS who come to our clinics because the gorilla in the room is really vascular EDS. So when you, when you learn about EDS and you go read about it, um, by the works by Dr. Google, by Dr. Wikipedia, uh, even those by other doctors who have talked here and will talk here, um, the thing that really is most difficult is that at some point in there, you see something like uh, Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome is a heritable connective tissue disorder that's characterized by joint hypermobility, skin alterations, and a propensity for vascular tears. And that's meant to cover all forms of um, Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome, but they are actually meant to apply only to some forms individually. And they're often taken to mean that all forms of Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome are at risk for having major vascular problems. And we cannot move forward usually in terms of working with people in our clinics until we unload that gorilla and do something either at the clinical level by examination, looking at people and saying, no, you don't have it, most people are not willing to do that or to do genetic testing, which has now become cheap, readily available, and quite reliable. So that's the reason that it's here. And I think the thing that's important to recognize is that, um, as you'll see, vascular problems are a major part of a small number of the forms of Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome. And for the vast majority of people who have hypermobility, it's not an issue, as far as we can tell. Now, of course, you heard Claire a little while ago saying that hypermobility EDS was really 100 different disorders instead of just one. And so within that set, yes, maybe there are some where vascular problems are at risk. But for the majority of people, that's not the issue. So, so this is from a very nice uh, paper um, that uh, Francisca Malfay wrote uh, about vascular aspects of Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome. And I will read it, but you can read it even faster than I can read it. It says, life-threatening arterial aneurysms, dissections, and ruptures of medium-sized and large arteries are a hallmark, a hallmark of the vascular subtype of Ehlers-Danlos syndrome caused by molecular defects in collagen type 3, which is an important constituent of blood vessel walls and hollow organs. That's the take-home message. They may, however, the they being life-threatening arterial aneurysms, um, also occur in other EDS subtypes, especially in classical EDS caused by defects in type 5 collagen or rarely type 1 collagen, and in kyphoscoliotic EDS caused by defects in lysyl hydroxylase 1 or FKBP22. Those are lysyl hydroxylase is a modifying enzyme for collagen, and FKBP22 is a protein that helps that uh, enzyme modify collagens. So when she says, they may, however, occur in other subtypes for, and the first example being classical EDS. They're rare in classical EDS. Uh, we don't know exactly how common, but they're unusual. And we've known about classical EDS for years, and they're rare events in classical EDS. So that determines how we actually take care of people with vascular EDS, and that screening and surveillance is not a part of the usual process. They're more common in the other forms, so that is the kyphoscoliotic form uh, that are due to mutations in these other genes. So you saw this <coughs> picture before. 
<coughs> excuse me, which is um, a representation of the, of the classification of Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. Mm -hmm. And, <coughs> sorry, um, when people talk about Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, you often lump them all together. That, that this is Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. Thank you. Um, and therefore, everybody who has anything on this table is at equal risk. And the answer is no, that's not the case. So um, what she meant is right here, and that is that um, classical EDS has a smaller risk. Vascular Ehlers-Danlos represents the largest risk for having um, vascular problems. Therefore, the name. The name itself is actually misleading because people actually have other problems as well. And they have uh, problems with uh, bowel rupture, uterine rupture occasionally in pregnancy, and other kinds of issues. And then the other two forms are lumped down there in the third one down called kyphoscoliotic EDS, and, um, which have the two genes that are involved. The yellow arrows there are next to two groups that might at some point be recognized as having a, a rare uh, condition called dermatosporaxis, and another one, the periodontal form of Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, which also is relatively uncommon. You will notice that, uh, where is it? Where is it? That's it. Number five there is hypermobile EDS. It's lurking there. It's a quiet little fellow. It's not doing much. Um, it's not calling attention to itself. It doesn't have a box around it. It's not represented in the list that uh, Francisca made. And as far as we can tell, it's not, uh, vascular problems are not a major issue in this group. We may find out that there's a subset where it is. So let me tell you a few stories so that you will recognize in your own minds uh, the people who are affected by this and what happens. So Darren is an actual person who is one of the first people that I saw with vascular EDS when I moved to Seattle, which is now 45 years ago. Um, he had a club foot at birth. He had a bowel rupture when he was six that was uh, confused with appendicitis. He had a bleed into the joint um, at the top of his tibia, the knee joint, at 12 that led to um, poor growth on that side. At 22, he had keratoconus, which is thinning of the cornea, that led to uh, corneal transplant, which is a rare complication of this condition. He had a stroke when he was 28, <clears throat> a brachial artery tear from bowling, um, <clears throat> and had colonic rupture at 35, which led ultimately to death from, from sepsis as a result of a very complicated postoperative course. In his family, this was a dominantly inherited condition. You heard Claire talk about inheritance. So, Darren is the square box in the middle that has the black marks in it. His mom died at the age of 34 of uterine rupture at the birth of his younger sister, who's the one on to the right. Darren had two children, two girls, uh, one who was um, unaffected and one that was affected. The affected one had uh, a pregnancy, and we were able to determine during the pregnancy that the pregnancy was unaffected and um, that uh, woman died when she was 41. So here is death at 34, 35, and then 41, uh, which is actually a little uh, younger than many people have. But that's not an atypical course, and <clears throat> those of you in the audience can look at the picture on the bottom and you can predict for yourself who is the affected one and who isn't. Here's a second family. She was the second person that we saw. Uh, she's actually from British Columbia. Um, she had, when she was born, she had bruising um, over her um, limbs. Uh, at 12, you can see the picture of her in the middle there. She looked certainly older than 12. Um, she had uh, an unusual skin condition called uh, elastosis perforans pyginosa, which is in the, uh, in, the, in the creases in the elbows. And at 28 or 26 are the pictures on the right and the visible, markedly easily visible venous pattern that you can see over the chest is one of the real hallmarks of this condition. And the aged hand, so you see her hands there. She looks like she's been doing dishes forever, um, but she, this is part of one, something that's called acrogeria. It's not, not everybody who has this condition has it. 
And then here's a third family, which is strikingly different. The family came to attention because of the young woman at the bottom, who at the time was 18. She had a persistent headache for about four or five days. It wasn't clear what it was due to. She had uh, an arterial study that was done. She had dim diminution of the vertebral artery on one side at that point that was thought to be the cause of it and thought to be due to a dissection or tear along the vessel. So an aneurysm is an expansion of a vessel. A dissection is a tear in the arterial wall. Um, and uh, she, was, she was recognized to have something unusual because the usual treatment for these things to maintain flow is to use anticoagulants as injections. And there are a couple of different ways of doing it. Uh, one is to take warfarin or aspirin, which are uh, work on the clotting systems. Um, another one is to inject with heparin or a heparin-derived product. She was um, a vegan and didn't want to have animal products, which she thought would be things that killed animals like rat poison, which is what Coumadin or warfarin is. And she chose instead to have injection of heparin, and, which is interesting because it actually is an animal product. <laughs> and uh, she got a big bruise at every injection site that occurred over there, and that led people to think there must be something wrong with, with, with her vascular vasculature, which led both to that and to the, um, the arterial problem. So they came to see us. Um, her dad at the time was 40, a little over 40, and uh, he was well. He had had no major problems except that he tore a calf muscle when he was descending Mount Rainier at the age of 40. Mount Rainier, for those of you who don't know, is a 14,000-foot mountain that we can see from Seattle on good days, and we have many good days in Seattle now, and especially more with global warming. Uh, so one of the benefits. They came with, their grand, with uh, her granddad, who at the time was in his uh, <clears throat> mid-60s, um, who went on to have an MI at the age of 72. He had bilateral knee replacements at 70 without major complications and was well at 80. So this is another variety of vascular EDS, but this is one in which one copy of the gene is is, doesn't function at all. It's basically turned off. And so people make half the normal amount of the collagen as opposed to making abnormal molecules, which is what leads to the earlier problems in, in the other people. None of them had uh, significant, except for the youngest one, had significant vascular problems. So we usually, in the course of discovery, we identify the most severe end of the spectrum first because they present, and then it's when we have genetic testing, uh, as Claire talked about, that we begin to identify people who have other kinds of mutations that are different. And we even find variations in the same gene that don't lead to the vascular complications of EDS, but have other uh, features. And one of the families that we talked with this morning is an example of that. You know, here's a very variant that Claire had referred to as a VUS, variant of uncertain significance. And for those of you who um, remember the Princess Bride, and there were those rodents events of undetermined size, that's what these always remind me of. Uh, I said that this morning. So those of you who are in the thing this morning recognize this story. Um, but it means that we don't know what they mean, just as they don't know when the rodents are going to appear. Um, and, but we have enough experience for the one that we saw this morning to say, yes, we know what that does, and it's, it is a change in this gene, but it's not vascular EDS. It's something other than that. So, and that's what we find out from doing this. And in this picture, um, the two women who are the second to the right and third from the right um, are sisters who have the very mild form, and you can't tell, and the other people really have distinctive features that you can see, and you can recognize that they're different. Here's a picture from uh, EDS Today, which is pictures of people who have this. So they have a fairly clear kind of presentation for the most part that's quite distinct. Hypermobility can be part of the presentation, but this is different. So classical EDS, which uh, uh, she mentioned, Claire talked about this this morning, had a, a group with it, so I assume that there are at least some people here with classical EDS. And the, the clinical features are really quite striking. The skin hypermobility that you can see on the upper left, the scars with hyperpigmentation in areas, and the scars are broad, and the very striking uh, joint hypermobility. The thing that is really striking in terms of diagnosis is the way the skin feels. 
And it's a hard concept to get across to people. Um, it's kind of like talking about sex and you know describing sex to people if they've never had it. You know, I mean, it's it's a really it's a challenging thing to get across. But um, so you know, we don't talk about sex with our trainees, but we do talk about how do you feel the skin and what does it feel like. And for those of you, some of you in the room will have made bread at some point, right? And you need the bread. That's what the skin feels like in people who have this. So it's a very distinctive feeling and very soft and uh, very, very different than uh, anybody else's skin. And here again at the bottom on the left, you see the pattern of inheritance. Though the first woman in this family who's affected with the dark circle, um, is the first one that had the mutation. And the mutation was in a type 5 collagen gene, and she has one affected one, that's the blue circle, and one that's not affected, which is the open circle. And you can see that both parents are unaffected. And so as Claire said, in the course of duplication, every time a cell divides, it duplicates all the genes in there. And it has to duplicate everything, and it needs to do it correctly but it's an error-prone mechanism. Not very prone, just a little bit, and that actually is necessary for a variety of other things, but it's very important. And so you can get changes, and that's what happened in this family. Once she has that, it could be he, um, there's a 50% chance of passing it on with each pregnancy, and you can see that she had two affected children and one unaffected children, or child, <laughs> and then one of the children also had a child that was affected. So uh, this is dominantly inherited. It's um, an uncommon condition. And within that group, uh, there are about six people who have been described, one with a rupture of the common iliac artery, uh, a second with an iliac artery, a third family with a renal artery rupture who had two children who were affected with the same kind of mutation, both of whom had vascular events. Here, the superior mesenteric artery, which is one that supplies the bowel. The third one is the mesenteric, and the fourth one, uh, the last one down there is the mesenteric artery. So no aortic uh, problems, but other major vessels that are problems, and in some cases uh, led to um, their uh, demise. In others, they were simply uh, complications. So the last group is the kyphoscoliotic uh, form of Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. This is the picture of the first young woman who was identified. And they're marked by having very marked uh, scoliosis or kyphoscoliosis, marked joint laxity, intractable scoliosis, difficult to uh, fix by surgery. They have the same kind of soft, velvety skin. Uh, some of them have ocular globe fragility can have keratoconus, and it's, this is a recessively inherited disorder, so two affected copies of the gene. Um, at birth, uh, it's often confused with um, neuromuscular disorders because the kids are quite uh, flexible and quite hypotonic, so their, their joints, they, they're, they're, you can just sort of move them around and they don't resist. And in fact, you can kind of make the diagnosis by picking them up and they just slide through your fingers. So it's an easy diagnostic test for many forms of Ehlers-Danlos, actually. And you can see the, the scoliosis developing. And it's recessive, you can see on the bottom right that in this family, neither parent was affected, but each was a carrier. The uh, son in that case received one altered copy of the gene from each parent. So they have a variety of different kinds of uh, vascular events. Most of them are in the visceral, visceral arteries. Uh, the first woman who is thought to have been recognized with this was one of Victor McCusick's patients, died uh, in the middle of the night and probably had an aortic rupture. And here you can see other forms. So again, this is quite a characteristic clinical presentation. It really is quite different than, than hypermobility. And the fourth is this is a patient that uh, Mitzi Murray and our group identified. Uh, about two months after the first report of these, she came and she talked to me and she said, I think I know what he's got, and this was it. <laughs> so it was really, she had read the first paper and it was striking. And we had seen him before that and thought that he had the usual form of, of um, uh, kyphoscoliotic disease. We tested all of that, he didn't have it. And you can see that as he grows up, he develops quite severe uh, scoliosis. He had very severe scoliosis, and the striking thing also is that he had really very marked vascular tortuosity. So this is a reconstruction of his um, angiogram. Um, the aorta comes down. This doesn't have a pointer in it, I don't think. Um, but the, the, um, 
the vessel at the top is the aorta. Those two that branch off are actually the um, renal arteries, and it comes down and then it divides, and those are the iliacs. The ili iliacs start around your belly button. You always think that they start in the groin, but they start at your belly button. And you can see that there's a lot of um, tortuosity of the vessel, which is one of the characteristic features of this. He's the oldest person that we know about who has this condition. And he's still, he's doing great. He's an architect. So this is what I mean, that uh, when we first begin to talk about this and people read about uh, vascular disease, at the very first, you know, it's a, it's a little word up there in the left-hand corner, and then you read something else, and somehow it pops up again and pops up again. And pretty soon, it becomes the major thing. I mean, it's the big thing. Why don't I have this? I'm terrified that I'm going to you know, have all of these kinds of things, and I've got to get over that diagnosis. And it's really quite, uh, it, it's often very difficult to work around. So all the things that we just heard about with all the kinds of physical therapy things are impossible to get going in that context. We really can't get beyond that often. So we will um, test. So in terms of management and care, this is a picture of what we think about. That there's, Surrounding the patient is, uh, uh, is a primary care physician who has EDS specialists and other people involved. And this is what we call a, a care team. Because for us, care is local. You live, you, know, you live wherever you live. Some of you live very close to major hospitals that have good things. Others of you live out in the boonies, and the boonies are not well supplied with all the people that you're looking at. So you need to have people who understand what's going on. You need to be able to talk with people. But your care is going to be local, and educating the local people is extremely important, and this is what we try to do for these rare conditions. Treatment um, surveillance is an issue. We're not quite sure how effective it is for uh, people who are at risk in, with these disorders. Blood pressure control is vital. Anticoagulation after dissection, as you heard, is really important. Surgical intervention with uh, stents is becoming more uh, commonly accepted. The very first stents were disasters, but now there are many examples of stenting in these conditions which are very effective, and that is a tube that's put in, inside the vessel. And that uh, invasive surgery is, we tried to make it unnecessary, um, and planned hypotension and judicious volume control after surgery. So if people don't get overhydrated is really important. So you, know, you don't take those bottles with you to surgery and continue to drink sur during surgery and then drink afterwards. We really have to rely on having uh, a low level of that so that the v blood vessels don't get too full. So that's where we are. I think if there's one thing to take from this, it is that Vascular problems are not a major issue in people who have hypermobile EDS. Thanks. Okay, wonderful, thank you. So we have a few quick questions before our next talk. Are there potentially other gene mutations that result in vascular tendencies that haven't been discovered yet? Yes. <laughs> What can I say? Yep. Um, <laughs> we, when we look for uh, mutations that cause aneurysms in people uh, who have both syndromic, that is, syndromes we can identify and non-syndromic forms, we identify mutations in somewhere between 20 and 40 percent. So we know that there's a lot of uh, uh, other genes out there that are probably causing it. Um, how common are PEs and DVTs in EDS? Well, they're not a, in EDS generally or in vascular EDS. EDS, in EDS generally. generally. Um, I don't know. I mean, they certainly do occur. We've had examples of major um, um, pulmonary emboli and, vas and um, deep vein thromboses. So the, the superficial veins, which are what you see with um, varicose veins, where you can feel them on your legs, are not usually the sources of the major uh, clots that go to the lung. Those are usually the deep veins. So they do occur. Um, so you know, wear compression stockings when you get on the plane. Um, do all the kinds of things that people suggest. Um, I, I'm not sure how, whether they are more common in people with EDS than not. Um, have, has there been any relationship uh, proven between hypermobile EDS and clotting disorders? <laughs> so you'll hear there. Um, um, where is he? Uh, Rohit was, is going to talk about, um, Rohit Jasudas is going to talk about bleeding and bruising in EDS. So bleeding and bruising 
are different manifestations of vascular involvement uh, than arterial tears or arterial dissections. And they represent defects that occur at the very small vessels, usually. They do occur, bleeding and bruising are part of the presentation for vascular EDS, also for most of the other forms of EDS. But the mechanisms are really different from the ones that, that give rise to dissections and tears in, in vessels. So they are common. Uh, they are actually very interested in the frequency with which they occur and whether there are people who are more susceptible to those findings uh, among the people who have hypermobile EDS uh, than others. And I think the answer will be yes. Um, whether they can be identified or not is another question. But uh, they, uh, they are around. So Rohith, and, uh, I don't think Christina uh, Lokaitis is here. She's, she's, all, she's coming later on in the she's week. She's coming tomorrow. So they, are, they have a study that's going on looking at these things in particular. Wonderful. Thank you so yes. much to Dr. Byers. Thank you.